a lot of headlines came out where it was like, the new cat lady is the plant lady. So I think there was this uh, level of craziness factor that was associated with it. But I actually don't think people are crazy who have plants. I do think that people without plants are a little bit crazy. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 326. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Each week, we'll bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And today we are sharing with you a really fun, interesting conversation we had with Summer Rain Oaks. She's an entrepreneur, author, and media host whose work focuses on health, wellness, and sustainability. Her website, Homestead Brooklyn, and YouTube series, Plant One On Me, help reconnect people to nature through the beauty of plants and gardening. Summer's latest book came out this past July, How to Make a Plant Love You, and this book was the focus of today's chat. You may see her in Brooklyn hanging out at her local community garden with her pet chicken, Kippy, or tending to her own copious indoor jungle of over 1,100 plants. You heard that correctly. It's incredible. And Summer really is truly inspiring and makes you want to have more plants at home. She does make it look so easy. When you get a chance to look at a picture of her apartment at home, you cannot believe how many plants just swarm her space and they all look so healthy and thriving. And she has definitely inspired Jesse and I to up our game and start getting more plants at home. We have a few, but we definitely want to get more of them. So here's what we talk about in today's show with Summer. We discuss how Summer is a self-confessed crazy plant lady, what houseplant trends look like around the world, why it's important to create the community you want to live in, the benefits of building a ritual with your plants, understanding quality and quantity of light, water, and soil, when to repot your plants, and how to get your plants on a fertilizing schedule. And this is something that Jesse and I also plan to do, is learning how to fertilize our plants and making sure that they're always thriving. So you are going to get so much from this episode. Summer is a pleasure to talk to. Here we go with Summer Rain Oaks. Hello, Summer Rain. It's so great to chat with you. Great to be here. We're excited to talk to you. And one of the places I want to start is part of your book dedication is to all the crazy plant people. So I'd love to know how many plants put someone into this category and when did you actually cross this threshold? Well, you know, I actually find it crazy when people don't have plants around them. <laughs> so anyway, I, it, this is kind of a little bit funny because when my my place went viral, because I have a lot of plants, about three years ago, you know, a lot of headlines came out where it was like, the new cat lady is the plant lady. And so I think there was this uh, level of craziness factor that was associated with it. But I actually don't think people are crazy who have plants. I do think that people without plants are a little bit crazy. <laughs> Take us back to that moment when you went viral. What happened there? Well, it was unplanned. was actually curating a food waste exhibit quite a number of years back. And one of my friends within the sustainable food industry introduced me to a lovely photographer by the name of Eliza. And she was shooting for Modern Farmer magazine at the time and was doing a food waste photo exhibit herself. And I was intrigued by what she was doing. She had been dumpster diving on the backs of these fine restaurants around New York City and finding perfectly edible food that was tossed out. And she was photographing them in the Dutch style of painting of the 1500s. So very beautiful photography using perfectly fine food. And I was intrigued by this. And I was like, my goodness, I would love to use some of your photos in the food waste exhibit that I am curating. And we got to talking and I was sharing with her that I vermicompost under my sink, which means I compost with worms under my sink, as one would. And uh, and she was like, oh, my goodness, you know, can I come over to your place and and actually photograph your worms? And I was like, yeah, I mean, OK, sure. But when she came in, she saw my plants and she was a little bit slack jawed and asked if she could take photos of my place. And she asked whether anybody had written about my place in the past. And I was like, yeah, you know, lots of people have written about my place because I've had a lot of plants in my home for for quite some time. But for whatever reason, it was her photos and it was the article that came out in conjunction with that that actually really hit a chord at the time that it did. And I don't know if it was a combination of 
just being packaged in a certain way or the way that media is now a little bit more voracious with social media or if it's just the current zeitgeist or all of the above or some of the above. But whatever the case, three years ago, I mean, that article went out and I think it was seen by at least 20 million people. And then a slew of other videos started to come out about my place. And I I think it's been seen like over hundreds of millions of times, which is really ridiculous. But it really inspired a lot of people. And, you know, I had so many people who came up to me afterwards. Most recently, I was just in, in London for my book tour. And one of the guys there who has a very beautiful home with plants had mentioned that his friends thought he was crazy with like 30 plants. And he's like, no, no, she's crazy. And then <laughs> showed them my video. And then it almost like gave people permission to have plants. And I'm not saying everybody, because a lot of folks already had plants, but I've heard from a lot of people, not just millennials, but across a range of ages who really have written me or approached me or have met me in my plant swaps or on book tour and had said that they're just so grateful that they had come across my video and it's touched them in different ways, in ways that I never expected. That's such an incredible story. And I'm just curious, at the time of going viral, how many plants did you have in your apartment? Well, Lisa asked, and I hadn't really done an inventory. So the number that went out there was around 500. But shortly after the article, I ended up counting them and it was close to 750. Now it's a little over 1100. And that's probably where it's going to be. I mean, I'm kind of constantly getting clippings and plants in and out all the time. So it's a moving target. But I try to share with people that it's really not about the number. And I think that The unfortunate symptom of my place going viral is that now a lot of folks qualify how many plants that they have. And, you know, my whole point of writing How to Make a Plant Love You and the videos that I do on on YouTube for Plant One On Me is really about connecting people to the deeper level of nature and keeping them more attuned to the environment around them. Sometimes one plant is enough for somebody. Maybe the amount that I have is just way too much. And if it starts to get into a place where you get stressy about it, I mean, I have another friend who has a greenhouse and he's like, I'm so stressed with all my plants. And I'm like, well, well, then why do you have them all? Because for me, that would partially defeat the purpose as to why I have them. And you talk about being at your threshold now with over 1100 plants. Is this because of time and the amount of time it takes to care for them or just the amount of space you have in your apartment or something else? I think it's more about the space for the apartment and kind of like what's the balance between having something that is not completely overtaking your house, something that's aesthetically pleasing and something that, you know, still stimulates you. And for me, I bring plants into my life for so many different reasons. The scientist in me really loves, you know, bringing in a a certain plant or plants and seeing if I could actually grow them indoors. You know, some of the plants that I have, I got from cuttings from horticulturalists or botanists that I've met through the last number of years. And I sometimes will see a plant and be like, I think that would be a really good house plant. And we could go into that and what that actually means. But yeah, I like to trial those things because not all of those plants had been commercialized or packaged up as house plants. And that's something that really appeals to me and something that I could share out to the general audience and allow them to see plants both individually and collectively as a whole, and get inspired by that. You mentioned being on book tour recently and being over in London. I'm curious, what's the culture like when it comes to plants overseas versus in the U.S.? Do you notice a real difference there? Well, I mean, I guess it really depends on where you are overseas. On my YouTube channel, I've been covering kind of this house plant trend, I guess you could say. It's not all house plants, but it's uh, plants in general across so many different countries. And I'm running a whole three-month episode on on Thailand. And if you look at Thailand, their culture is deeply ingrained in plants and being able to hybridize and cultivate plants for the longest time. So plants and Thai people are almost like uniquely interwoven with one another. In the UK, you have a rich gardening history and and that's mainly for outdoor garden spaces. But now you're seeing an influx of interest in the houseplant market. 
The same thing goes for the Netherlands. I mean, when you think of Holland and the Netherlands, you think of like tulip bulbs and plants like that. And so they are one of kind of the leading exporters of certain plants like anthuriums and orchids and carnivorous plants and bulbous plants and for both indoor and outdoor. And I just learned that they're starting to feel a little bit more confident in the different types and varieties of plants that they could offer in the houseplant market. So you're starting to see a lot of interesting plants hit the houseplant market that you wouldn't be able to see even 10 years ago. And that's partially spurred by social media. Social media in general has really reduced the borders and has greater consumer demand now because typically it was the garden centers and plant shops that would demand different plants and things like that. But now it's really coming from the consumer. And in the U.S., you know, we've always had gardening here as a hobby, but we don't have kind of like this deep connection or history to gardening in the same way that Thai people do or the British or even like Japanese or Chinese. They have rich, rich histories of gardening and gardening culture. And I think that we're in some way, especially those of us who are picking up plants for the first time, are starting to find some deeper value in it and look at plants way beyond decor. Summer, I want to take things way back and get into your story and actually take things all the way back to your birth and your given name, Summer Rain Oaks. And this name was given to you, I found this on Wikipedia, because of a downpour on the day of your birth in June. So really unique name, lovely name, great story behind it. I'm curious, do you get asked by a lot of people if this was your given name? Yes, of course. I mean, I think that in the age of stage names and worked in sustainability and fashion and had been in media for a little bit of time. So that's almost like a given when people think that your name is actually made up. But no, my parents like grew up in more of the hippie generation, I suppose. And my brother's name is Travis Shane, so it actually rhymes with mine. So it was something that my mother did. And then my father gave me, of course, the last name. But I did get to pick my middle name, which is Hyacinth, which is the name of a flower. So I kind of kept on with the environmental theme, if you will. Very fitting. Take us back to being a kid. You talk about spending a lot of your time outdoors. Yeah. So I grew up in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And in my book, How to Make a Plant Love You, I really share a lot of those stories kind of growing up in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And I've met a number of people who are in and around the same area who have very similar stories that really touched, you know, some of those folks that I've met on book tour. But I grew up in an area where it was old coal mining communities. Now it's kind of like fracking, which is hydraulic fracturing underneath the ground. So it's like one extraction to another. But I just saw that the coal mining industry had really kind of destroyed some of the, not only the economy, but also the environment And that was something that really resonated with me as a child. So I got really engaged in my community and just the natural surroundings. During the summer, I was a little bit more of a loner. I had good friends in high school, but I spent most of my time actually outdoors alone in the summer months. And I was very happy with that because I never really felt alone. (laughs) And it gave me an opportunity to really explore the outdoors in ways that I didn't know would be helpful because by the time that I went to university, where I knew I wanted to study ecology and environmental sciences and things like that. I didn't realize, but I had a really deep understanding and rich background in ecological principles even before going to university. And I think that's in part for spending all the time outdoors that I did. And I know your parents, they had a vegetable garden and an orchard. Is this where your initial love for plants began? I think that was part of it for sure. My parents are great gardeners. But we also just grew up on a plot of land that had farm, field, and forest. So it was just a really good playground for me. And I really liked the wild plants as well. So the cultivated plants were interesting, but the wild plants for me were something to really marvel at. And so I took my mom's Rodale Herb Guide book. I think it was from the 1970s. And I would also take her National Geographics and a number of other things and just really dive right into that information. I mean, I think that I'm one of the elder millennials, if you will. So I grew up in a time when it wasn't always accessible on computer, but I was just sharing with my friend. I'm actually like really grateful (laughs) of the time that I grew up when I did because 
I think if I grew up in a time like now, I would be sucked in in the way that my cousins are sucked into their screens and having so much screen time. And I think I would have been a very different person than I am today if I had grown up in the now time as opposed to the then time. And I say the same thing all the time where as a kid, I grew up out in the country, spent a lot of time outdoors and without the internet, without computers. And then just at quote unquote, the perfect time, computers and the internet blew up. And now Marnie and I run this podcast and this business from online. So I'm really grateful to have the online world, but I'm very grateful to have that childhood spending time outdoors in nature and on the water. Professionally, it has transformed people's lives. I mean, it entered into the gig economy, allows you to be an entrepreneur yourself in real time. And I joke about it, though, because I'm like, you either work 80 hours a week for yourself or 40 hours a week for somebody else. <laughs> but that being said, I don't think I get enough outdoor time compared to other people in the city, probably spend more time outdoors than the average person. But it's hard to get off the computer and and I agree with you. I mean, I think that as a kid, it's really important. And for people who are thinking about raising children, you know, that is something that I know that parents really, really struggle with, especially because it is so addictive. Let's talk about your transition. You grow up in the country. How do you end up in the city? Is this when you're going to university? Well, during university, I didn't realize that I had such a, a really good grounding in ecological principles. So in working with my advisor at Cornell, she recognized this in me and really allowed me to focus more of my efforts on a little bit more advanced courses, you know, being able to skip maybe some of the 101 courses and be able to concentrate a little bit more on my passions and honing skills. During that time, I started to think about, especially because a lot of my friends weren't in kind of like the environment in the same way that I was, it really got me thinking about like, well, how do I really communicate these issues out to a wider audience? And I started to look at something I'm terribly still illiterate in. I always say I'm pop culturally illiterate. <laughs> but, um, you know, I started looking at pop culture and music and fashion and clothes and what we wear and how we're perceived. And so I got it in my head to maybe do something in sustainability and fashion, which 15 years ago, that really wasn't a thing. Those, you know, sustainability and fashion were very unlikely bedfellows. Those two words weren't even being used in the same sentence. And I basically started to look for people or professionals who were maybe exploring that region of interest. And quite frankly, like some of the people who are still involved in it now, I had met 15 years ago when they were just also starting in the industry. That's been exciting because, you know, I think I had a really big part in bringing sustainability to the fashion world and popularizing that through my professional endeavors. And so while I was doing this in university in various different ways, and I don't have to get into that, but I basically decided that I would have to go when when the time came that I would have to leave university and graduate. The only place to really go for the fashion industry was New York City, and it was close enough to where I grew up and where I went to school. So it didn't feel like a huge transition at first. But of course, when you get to the city, it is a big transition. So yeah, I, I planned on doing my projects there for, oh, I don't know, like two years. I remember thinking that like, oh, I'll do my projects here for two years and then I'll move. I didn't know where I would move, but I just figured I wouldn't be in the city. And fast forward 15 years later and I'm still here. <laughs> so after university is when you moved to New York City? Yeah, but I actually started commuting to New York, I think my second or third semester of college. So it's a five-hour bus ride. It's a grueling bus ride. But I went so frequently almost every week. So I would do my courses on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then I would take a bus on Thursday. And I'd be down in the city Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I would get back up on either Sunday night or Monday morning and start going back into classes again. So it was a really intense three years or so. The only times I wouldn't usually go to New York and work is during exam time. So it was pretty intense because I was working work study positions and going to taking a full load at an Ivy League university and then traveling on top of that. So there was very little margin for error, I would have to say, during those years. 
Talk about that transition. I know you're traveling quite a bit beforehand, but when you finally made that move and committed to live in New York City full time, what was that like for you? Was it like shell shock or, you know, coming from the country to the big city? What was that like? I think because I was so active, like my mind was so active and working, I just sometimes didn't have a time to really think about it. But I didn't have the time to literally do the things that I loved doing, which was going outside for a run or dropping into the gorges or swimming in the the lakes or doing any of that. I just kind of accepted my position at that point. And that was to some point exciting because it was something new and different, but it was also, it could wear on you for sure. And so the city is big enough that you have to make it your own. And I have to say that over the last number of years, as I've matured, as the area where I live has evolved, I've definitely found an incredible community. And part of that is by, and this is a theme in the book, creating the community that you really want to live in. And there's more green spaces that have opened up. I've been very involved in my community garden. I volunteer every day of the week that I'm here, at least an hour a day. I right now volunteer at the Senior Citizen Service Center, and I volunteer for their chickens in their garden in the back. So these things are all positive influences. So when I started to bring plants in my house, partially because, I don't know, I'm just like a really proactive person. Like, I'm not a reactive type. So I have brought plants into my home as a part because I'm like, this is kind of what I need. And I think I identify that. I think I identify like where things feel a little off and, uh, and I go and try to change it if it's within my power. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Summer to give a shout out to our brand new show partner, XPT Life. Whether you already are an athlete or someone looking to get back into a healthy fitness routine, finding a new program that pushes you to grow physically and mentally sometimes can seem out of reach because most fitness apps focus on weightlifting workouts or six-pack abs and some wellness apps just don't challenge you enough. And XBT Life is inspired by the training techniques of Laird Hamilton and Gabby Reese, both who were former guests on the podcast, hopefully you listen to those shows, and they know how to push things to the limits. And this app will challenge you with breath, movement, and recovery curriculums designed to stimulate growth in all aspects of human performance. By doing the exercises in this app, you will enhance the quality of your everyday life and reduce stress. Jesse and I have had the opportunity to go through some of the programs and breath work in this. Obviously, I'm a little bit limited right now being pregnant, but I love what they have to offer and the variety that's available in this app. And right before recording today, I actually did a belly breathing exercise and I really loved it. It made me feel grounded, relaxed, and focused before recording, so it was great. As a listener of our show, you get access to this app for free by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash xptlife. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash xptlife. Use our link to gain access to this revolutionary training app for free. Enjoy. And now a shout out from other show partner, Organifi. It's one thing to be surrounded by green plants, And it's another thing to make sure that they're a staple in your diet. You probably know by now that Jesse and I don't skimp out on consuming lots of green vegetables. And sometimes we even use them as a supplement and especially in Organifi's green juice powder. This is such an easy way to get an extra boost of greens. It's just insurance knowing that it's going into your body. So a great way to consume the green juice powder is in your morning water or throughout your midday water. You can just sip on it and get the benefits of greens and superfoods and hydration, of course, and it tastes good. So don't skimp out on your greens. Make sure you're getting more than enough in from both real food sources and supplements like Organifi's green juice powder. This is an incredible product. We know you're going to love it, and you're going to love the fact that you save 20% off as a listener of our show. To take advantage of your listener discount, go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Go and pick yourself up some of the Organifi green juice powder today and get your greens on. And now back to our chat with Summer. Isn't it right that you got your first plant after your roommate moved out? You guys were living in your apartment together in New York City. And when this roommate moved out, 
you went and got your first plant. Yes, that's right. I got a ficus lyrata, which I still have today. It's a giant fiddle leaf fig. So anybody who has struggled over a fiddle leaf fig, I have a, a great how-to video on it on my YouTube channel as well. But yeah, she moved out. She went moved back to Brazil and I moved in with her. So I really didn't want to impose my kind of taste onto her. So when she moved out, the place was pretty cavernous. It was really bare and it really echoed. It echoed when I was in here because it was like so just like walls. And when I first got the ficus lyrata, I was like, oh my God, that is totally what I needed and what this place needed. And then I don't even remember what the second or third or fourth plant was. I know plants that I've had for a very long time, but I can't quite put my finger on what the second, third, and fourth was and how quickly I started to acquire plants. But I have photos from my old house, and so it's neat to see how it's literally grown. Why the decision for this plant? Like, what was it about the fig leaf plant that uh, attracted you in the beginning? I think because when she moved out, it was so cavernous. I actually have a, a fairly large apartment for New York City because I, I think I moved into an area of New York that nobody wanted to move into 15 years ago. And that was a benefit because I was able to get a little bit more space. But when she moved out, a lot of the furniture moved out with her. And I needed something that was like sizable enough that could potentially fill a room. And so my fiddle leaf fig, when I got it, you know, there's not many plants that could fill out a room and be quite large. You know, there's some that have a little bit more of a pendant shape or some that are like a little bit more upright that are slow growing. But like a fiddle leaf fig is like one of those ones that could fill out a room eventually. And it did. I actually had to cut it back by about two thirds because I had unelected construction in my house and the construction workers kept on bumping into it. So it's a lot smaller than what it had been or got a little bit of a haircut, but it's still quite large. It's probably around 15 feet now. Wow. And you mentioned earlier, now you have over 1,100 plants in your home. So of course, the question that comes to mind is, how do you take care of all of them? I know you have a day, Sunday, that you dedicate to caring for your plants, but walk us through that. How do you care for so much greenery in your home? I've been traveling quite a bit, and I always hire a professional. So I have the benefit of having a lot of plant shops around my neighborhood, and I usually hire somebody who works at a plant shop in order to be able to come and take care of them. So Anybody who has questions and when I actually travel, because I have been having to go for filming and for, for book tour. But aside for that, it's kind of like an everyday process. So usually in the morning, I walk around and I top off my plants. Maybe it's a 15, 20 minute day kind of ritual, if you will. So the same way that somebody might grab coffee or tea in the morning, which I do I grab my tea in the morning, especially now in the colder weather. Typically, I'll just kind of go around and survey the plants. Right now, I have a house mouse, I have to say, in my house, and it's been eating some of my plants, which I've been really upset about gnawing and nibbling on them, which I did not expect to have. Yeah, otherwise than that, I'm just kind of like seeing the plants, you know, trimming them, seeing if there's any pests on them. And then by the time Sunday comes around, it feels a little less intense because I've been kind of taking care of my plants on a regular basis. And then on Sunday, that's kind of like my holy day, I call it. So that's when I, you know, might be spending a lot more time with my plants. Maybe it's at least it's an hour and a half probably now. At most, it could be eight hours, depending on what I need to do, like repotting, reshuffling. Right now, I ended up getting a bunch of cuttings from a botanic garden. So I'm propagating them. And that doesn't always work out because I don't really have a designated propagation area. So it's usually the most resilient ones that actually could take root, especially now in the colder weather. It's harder for a lot of plants to take root. So it's definitely a ritual. And I actually think that that's probably the biggest benefit that people can get from their plants. I mean, there's all sorts of different benefits that you could say like, oh, it cleans your air and it can make you more creative and make you calm. But really, I think it's about building a ritual with your plants and going through that journey and learning from them and learning about yourself through the lens of your plants. And there's also things you want to consider in order to make your plant thrive. And I know you talk about water, light, soil, and making sure all these things are in check in order to keep your plants nice and healthy. So I know there's a lot of detail because it depends on the plant. But let's talk about lighting first. Let's get into why it's important to position the plant in the right place in your home, what that might look like for people. What are we looking for? 
I recently did a video called Finding the Right Plant, uh, Putting the Right Plant in the Right Place. And that is really, to your point, really based on light because that is what plants use for food. And so most of us are actually working in a situation where we have lower light situations. Maybe we have a north facing window and we're not getting a lot of light. And there's, of course, different ways to work around that. But the most important thing is to understand what kind of quality, intensity, and quantity of light that you're getting in your house. And when I do workshops, most people actually don't know what direction their windows face. And this is really important. Of course, like sometimes our windows might be south facing if you're in the northern hemisphere, for example, and that could be a lot of intense light. But if you're being enshrouded by a tree outside or a building or you're facing a brick wall or you have tinted glass, then this is obviously going to affect the quality and the intensity of the light. So these are things that obviously you have to take into consideration. But in general, if anything was unobstructed and you're talking about the northern hemisphere, then south, west, east, and north are all going to have various different intensities of light. And of course, you might have like a southwest facing window or northeast facing window like I do, and that will affect also the intensity of the light. And I know in my southwestern windows, I get a lot of hot light, typically in the summer months, in the winter a little less so. And you could see that by harder shadows. And compared to my northeast windows, which have really gentle light coming in in the morning hours. So this will help you determine actually what kind of plant you might need. Because if you have a north facing window and somebody gives you a cactus and says, oh, cacti are so easy and you'll never kill them. And then you try to put that cactus in a north facing window, you will probably kill it because you just didn't have the right kind of light for it to begin with. So these are things to kind of take into account. Then after you know the quality, intensity, and quantity of light in your home, you're going to want to understand a little bit more of the type of plant parent, for lack of a better word, that you might actually be. So if you're somebody who's like a helicopter parent or if you're somebody who travels all the time and wants to be a little bit more hands-off, that's really important to know. Then you're going to have to determine, based on your space and what kind of person you are, where are you going to put that plant? Is it on your windowsill in your southern window? Is it hanging from a hanging basket up on the ceiling so your cat doesn't get it? Is it something more towards the corner and you can't take up a lot of space? So you need something that's like really straight and upright. So you're starting to get into like the form and the morphology of plants and where you're actually going to put it. Then I would say arguably the fourth one would be what's your aesthetic? And oftentimes this is flipped. So when we go into a store, we kind of go into a plant shop or garden center and we're like, oh, I love that plant. It looks so awesome. I want that for my bedroom. But we don't ask questions one, two, and three first. And we kind of then just look at that plant as a decor item. And that is then challenging. And you might get lucky, but you also might be setting yourself up for a lack of success. And then I think that's how people say, oh, well, I have a black thumb, which basically means I kill plants. And that's not a vote of confidence for yourself. So I do believe that there is a plant for somebody out there at some point in their lives. It may not be at this point, but you know, those are the tactics I think that somebody could go into or the questions that they could be answering for themselves before they actually step foot into a plant shop or a garden center. And is there a specific general plant you recommend to beginners, something that's really hardy, something they can really build confidence in before they move on to some harder varieties? Yeah, there are several, and they're usually really readily available. One is something that I recommend to a lot of people. It's called a ZZ plant. ZZ stands for its scientific name, which is Zamiel Kulka Samiofolia. And it is a very hardy plant. I actually have it growing in my interior space. And oftentimes when I try to give people an example of a plant, it's something that could grow across a range of conditions. Just note that plants usually respond to more light. And if you stick a ZZ plant in your southern southwestern window, it's going to be a lot happier than if you stick it in kind of the interior of your space with just ambient light. That being said, I have ZZ plants in both settings and both are doing well. Of course, the one in the southwest facing window is growing much more regularly than the one that's in the interior of my space. 
The next one I would recommend is aglionema, which some people actually don't like the look of because it's like a typical office plant. But this is a plant that typically grows in the understory of forests. So it's a little more used to being in a lower light condition. And there are so many different types of cultivars, which are cultivated varieties of plants. So they have like lots of different colors and patterns. And then if you want something that's a little bit more like a hanging plant or one that could shingle or climb up a trellis or anything like that, then I would recommend two. And one is an Epipremnum aureum, otherwise known as devil's ivy or golden pothos. You'll see this at any like bodega, garden center, or plant shop that you probably have around you. It's one of the most common varieties. It's green with kind of splashes of like yellow. They have different cultivars, some of the splashes of white and a number of others. And then another hanging one would be Syndapsis pictus, which is known as satin pothos, not necessarily directly related to the golden pothos, but has a thicker leaf a darker green leaf with like real splotches of silver. And again, it's something that's like fairly common and some different cultivars are coming off out all the way from really dark, dark green to almost completely silver, which is super cool because it's like really bizarre to see a silver plant. And when it comes to lighting, is there anything that a typical window pane is blocking, like certain rays from the sun that a plant would get outside that it won't get inside? It actually really depends on your windows. So you might have a single pane, or I think most of us have double panes. There are glass now that a lot of skyrise buildings have where it will block out certain UV rays, which might actually be harmful for plants and make your life a little bit more uncomfortable if you're in like a glass box house, for instance. So it really just depends on the light. I have something called a PAR meter. You could get something that, you know, measures in foot candles as well, which is not necessarily the way that plants see light, but it's the way that we see light. But you could get a sense of like the quality of light that's actually coming into your space. Generally, if you have like a double pane window, I think, but don't quote me on this, I think there's a 20% reduction of quality of light actually coming into your space. However, sometimes the reflections on the windows and I have mirrors on the edges of some of my windows. And when that bounces, it could actually intensify and some plants could actually not handle that and they could get a bad burn and it could actually start to disintegrate or grade the chlorophyll much in the same way that if we were outside and we get a bad sunburn and you start building up free radicals in your body. Something very similar happens in plants except that it affects the magnesium, which is what essentially makes plants green, and the leaf starts to get chlorotic or otherwise turn yellow. And let's talk about water and soil. You know, there's so much here, too, to learn in terms of what kind of plants thrive in different kinds of soil. I know that, you know, some of the cactuses and succulents tend to like a drier soil. This is something so hard to learn, and this is coming from someone who does call herself... I block them um, because I've tried so (laughs) many times and succulents is what is often given to me or what I tend to gravitate towards like everybody else and buy a lot of because I'm like, oh, they're supposed to be so easy. And then I end up overwatering or underwatering or I don't know the difference, which is another question I want to get to too, is how to know when a plant is oversaturated or undersaturated. Let's talk about soil and, and watering techniques. Yeah, well, let's talk about watering first because we just got off the topic of light and you really want to water your plants based on the intensity, quality, and quantity of light that you're giving them. So if you are putting your plant into some high light conditions, then it will likely dry out faster and you will need to water it a little bit more frequently. The second thing I would say on in regards to kind of what is the best soil and the soil type, you know, this will vary. And I can't really suggest any brands. More I could talk about the quality of the soil. And if you're somebody who fears that you are going to overwater your plant, there's a really good solution or many different solutions for that. One is just getting a very porous soil. And porous just means that there's a lot of air, air pockets in it. And how do you build up the porosity of your soil? Well, you get things that water won't stick and expand to. And so sometimes people will bring in perlite, which is this kind of like white styrofoam looking ball, but it's actually just puffed volcanic stone. You might get some vermiculite, which does absorb a little bit of water, but that is puffed mica. Then you could get 
lava stones or even recycled glass stones that they have now that you could mix in with your potting medium. And I work with a lot of growers and botanists, and we kind of joke when we're propagating plants and things like that how much perlite they actually do mix into their soil. And so sometimes the running joke is like, well, how much potting medium do you actually have to your perlite? Because it's primarily perlite. So if you're watering and you have a very airy soil, well, that water is going to drain through to the basin, if your planter has a hole in the bottom, into the basin more easily. So you're probably going to water more frequently because the porosity is higher But you know at least you're never going to overwater your plant. You know, if you have a potting medium where it just like kind of saturates the soil, which is good for certain plants, some plants actually do need high moisture. And again, this goes back to just kind of knowing your plant. Ferns, for instance, in general, are plants that require a little bit more higher moisture. Prayer plants, which are quite popular, people will know them as calatheas, but Most of them have gotten moved over to a new genus called Jopertia, which doesn't really like roll off the tongue very easily. Those want a little bit more of a moister soil, so you might have a little less porosity. But for those cacti and succulents, provided that you're giving them the right kind of light, which would probably be a little bit more in a southern or a western window, depending on the cactus or succulent, then probably want to have a little bit more of a porous medium so you're not overwatering it because a lot of those roots could be very sensitive to overwatering and you would want to water it again based on the light that you're giving it. I'd say in a general sense because I've been growing plants, cacti and succulent in my southwest facing window, in general I like water it once a week, maybe a little bit more depending on the intensity of the sun in the summer months and then as the fall and winter start to come For my succulents, I go probably once every couple weeks. And my cacti, most of my cacti, except for my jungle cactus, I stop watering completely from November to March. Most of them go through a dormancy. So I'm not usually watering them very much in the winter months unless I'm giving them like augmented light through grow lights. And I think it's important to highlight too that when we are watering, we want to make sure we're giving the plant a good soak so the water actually goes all the way to the bottom of the soil and gets to those root ends or root hairs, because that's where a lot of the water is absorbed into the plant. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. And if you water too superficially, the roots are going to want to grow up and then the plant will probably tip over. Plants roots need both air and water and water is their river in order to be able to take up the nutrients. So if you're not watering appropriately and you're not soaking the soil and you want to soak the soil, so you want to make sure that your potting medium is kind of porous, because if you are soaking it and that water is stuck in there, it's not going to get any air and the roots are going to asphyxiate. And is there a point when we know when it's best to repot a plant, like other than it tipping over or looking too crowded? Sometimes is there like a chance just before it gets to that point that we can repot it? Sometimes, you know, roots will start to appear from the bottom out of the hole of the pot. Sometimes the plant will literally throw and hoist itself out of the pot itself. In some cases, like certain anthurium, which have really very Hulk-like roots, they will literally bust out of their pot unless they're in like a concrete pot. But if they're in terracotta, if they're in plastic, they'll literally bust out. Sometimes plants are not getting enough nutrients and they've eaten up the soil. So maybe their leaves are starting to get smaller. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. How come they're not putting on new growth in the growing season? Or how come their leaves are really small? It might actually be nutrient deficiency, but it also could be that they just can't get any more nutrients because there is none because they've exhausted the soil. Roots could be spiraling around. You could see roots from the top. That could also be a byproduct of you watering too heavily and the soil being pushed out from the top. There's all sorts of different things, but those are some of the indications. And you mentioned the soil running out of nutrients. Let's talk about that and how do we know when that's the case and what are some easy ways to replenish it? The key is probably to get your plants, especially in the growing season, on a schedule for fertilizing. And generally, fertilizers, they need so minute amount of micro and macronutrients that you're not going to be over-fertilizing. Over-fertilizing could actually kill your plants. Cacti and succulents, they don't need a lot of nitrogen. So fertilizers have an NPK value, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and it's always in that kind of order. And sometimes they might have micronutrients like boron or molybdenum or iron or a number of others. And that could be important for plants, but they need it in such micro amounts that it's not that intense. And I know some people have gone for years without fertilizing their plants. 
However, it does help. And if you start to notice like your plant is starting to yellow or it's starting to slow its growth or it's starting to get a lot of plant pests on it, then you might not be getting your plant, you know, the healthiest um, that it could possibly be. So getting it on a fertilizing schedule is important. This is actually something that I'm, I'm doing a project now called 365 Days of Plants. I think I'm like 169 days into it right now. I try to highlight one plant every day and I go through kind of where am I growing it in my home? You know, where is it from? And some of the other like basics, like how I'm watering it, the fertilizing schedule, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that has really helped people because they kind of learn a new plant every day and it starts to make people recognize that there's different care tips for specific plants. But as you could start to see in general groupings of plants like Hoya in general, very popular plant right now, otherwise known as wax plants, they're not really heavy feeders. Same thing with some of their cousins like Serapegia and Dyskidia. You know, these are plants that aren't really heavy feeders. So I don't like have to fertilize them all that much. And then in the dormant seasons or the non-growing seasons, you're usually not fertilizing at all. We're people that fall into that category of non-fertilizers at this point, but watching your YouTube video on different fertilizers, I'm definitely inspired. I'm going to look into it more and, and start applying them after this chat. And I'm really into looking into the organic fertilizers. I know you talk about synthetic and organic, so I'm going to do a deeper dive into that and, and figure out a protocol for us. I have a little schedule that I roughly follow. And I think that once you start to acquire more plants, you have to become a little bit more um, organized or else you'll fall off the schedule. <laughs> well, you've definitely inspired us to get deeper into plants all around and fertilizing is part of that. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Summer to give a shout out to our show partner, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto has had a nut butter in their roster for some time now, but they've just given their nut butter an upgrade, and they upgraded their entire line by adding in new varieties and even their packaging. So now they come in a squeeze pack, which makes it super easy to use and pretty easy to eat. I'm not going to lie. You can just easily squeeze it into your mouth. And they have a couple of different blends, which include chocolate hazelnut, almond butter and jelly, and snickerdoodle. And you can also get a variety pack of all three if you can't decide. And the ingredients that are in these nut butters will totally blow your mind. It's things like hazelnuts, coconut, almonds, cashews, cocoa butter, stevia, macadamia nuts, MCT oil. It depends on the blend and there'll be a different combination of ingredients in that blend. And to date, Jesse and I have tried the almond butter and jelly. I squeezed some on some pumpkin muffins I made this week. And it is such a delicious nut butter. So excited for you guys to try this. You've got to get your hands on them, and I definitely recommend trying all three of them. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off the whole Perfect Keto lineup by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Other great news, these products ship worldwide, and if you live in the U.S., it's free shipping. Go and get yourself the three-pack of these nut butters today and give all three flavors a try. You're going to love them. And now a shout out from other show partner, Sun Warrior. Protein powder is not just good for smoothies, but you can also use it in your baking and raw desserts. And this is something that I've been doing for many years. It's just a fun way to add an extra dose of plant protein into things like brownies or raw truffles or any kind of dessert that you're making. You can give it a boost. I like to keep a tub of the Chocolate Warrior blend on hand, especially for my chocolatey desserts. And this is the time of year where I'm really getting into dessert making and baking and giving it a dose of extra protein is always a good thing. So if you haven't tried using protein powder in your desserts, I highly recommend giving it a go. And then your protein powder has two uses. You can use it for smoothies and drinks and in some treats. And as a listener of our show, Living in the U.S., you get 20% off your Sun Warrior purchases by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. On top of that, if you spend $50 or more, you get free shipping. Go and load up on your favorite Sun Warrior protein today and take advantage of your discount. And now back to our chat with Summer. Summer, I want to talk about an observation exercise you talk about in your book. And this is a mindfulness practice that I really liked. And it's when we go on walks, we're picking out a plant in our neighborhood and observing it and observing its changes over time. So can you take us through what we do there? 
this is part of what I call active observation in a book. The book's core theme is about how plants create the community that they want to live in, and so can we. And the way that we could really be good to ourselves and our community and the world environment through the lens of plants, there's a lot to learn. And active observation is one of those things where studying as an environmental scientist and going out as a naturalist, like you go out and you observe plants. You don't always necessarily have a field guide on you. And you don't always know what that plant is and you can't Google it, but you want to know. And so you start to observe its qualities and you say, okay, well, why is it mottled and speckled the way that it is? And why is it growing up the tree and not on the ground? And does it have clingers or claspers? And is it leafier on one side and not the other? What color is it? So all of these things are just starting to observe this plant and starting to understand its nuances. And the benefit of this is many things, but one of the benefits is that you start to create stories about this plant. You develop a little bit more of a relationship with it. So you're actually pulling yourself out of the cacophony that might actually be happening on the outside of you, which if you're in the city, there's probably much. If you're in the country, maybe a little less, but you are pulling yourself into the story of this plant and observing it and creating these theories about why it is the way that it is. And even if your theories are wrong, it almost doesn't matter because that's not the real benefit. The real benefit is that your cogs are turning in that kind of direction. And you're developing this relationship with this plant. You're starting to become interested in this plant and maybe even care for this plant. And I think these are the types of skills, these soft skills that we don't often talk about when we start to bring plants into our environment, like in our home, that I think actually makes us arguably really superior plant people, but also just superior people in general in the sense that you're starting to develop this kind of observational prowess with another living being. And I think it's really important how this can mirror how people can also live. You know, if you're going to put this much effort into caring for your plants, you know, soil quality, the water quality, which I actually want to get into, and sunlight and exposure, these are things we need to be doing for ourselves as well. We need to get out in sunshine. We need to find ways that make us thrive. So there's a really nice symbolic relationship there that can really mirror people's own health routine. So I really like that. And I've heard you talk about that before. So since I mentioned water quality, we didn't really touch upon that. We talked about how much. What about water quality? Because for some people living in a city, and I know you're in Brooklyn and people who are in New York or people who are in other city dwellings might feel that their water quality is very poor or they've tried different sources and some plants have thrived and some have died. So how important is this and what should we look for? Yeah, I mean, it really actually depends on your plant and it depends obviously on your water because different water sources have different qualities to them. I mean, almost all of our water is unfortunately fluorinated and in some cases chlorinated in the States. And to me, it's just a tragedy beyond tragedies. But a you know, number of plants, especially those in the, like I mentioned, the prayer plants are extremely, extremely sensitive to fluoride and chlorine in the water. And sometimes these are things that you can't actually extract from even your regular filters on your water. So I actually have like this really intense filter that takes out a lot of different heavy minerals and metals, chlorine and fluorine and everything else. It's actually attached to a hose that I have in my house that I have to, you know, water plants with. And in some cases, I'll water plants with distilled water. So Quality water is important, but for some plants, it's a little less important. And again, you just have to know which ones are a little bit more of the sensitive ones. And that actually comes through observation again. If you feel like you're doing everything in your power to make a plant happy, and then all of a sudden you water it and it starts to get brown edges or brown tips or things like that, then you might actually start to say, well, could this actually be my water? You know, that is one of the theories that you could actually test, even though you don't have like the right kind of scientific equipment in order to be able to do that. It's something that comes with observation and intuition. So we definitely have to talk about your pet hen, Kippy. You have this pet chicken <laughs> in your home, which is so amazing and so cool. So tell us about this, how you acquired her, and what this relationship has been like. Well, I ended up inadvertently getting a chicken because I had been at my community garden and there was an oven bird that actually got caught in an inhumane rat trap because one of the folks in the garden took it upon himself to put like these glue traps, which are just terrible, terrible, terrible. 
And there were some insects that got caught in the glue trap. And then this poor little oven bird came flying down and got stuck in the glue trap. And so I ended up having to take it to a rehabilitation center here in New York City. And while I was waiting around for the prognosis on the oven bird, this little hen, Kippy, her name was Cornbread at the time, but she jumped on my lap and I was just like completely smitten. And the rehabilitation center is always desperate to get fosters. And they are called the Wild Bird Fund. And of course, chickens are not wild birds. But unfortunately, there is an influx of chickens that get put into the rehabilitation centers because around Easter, which is around the time that I got the oven bird, people like to hatch chickens and bunnies and have them for like an Instagram moment with their kids. And then they toss them out. Unfortunately, in schools, they always want to incubate things. So they incubate birds in kindergarten or bio class and all that other kind of stuff. And then again, they don't have any option of what to do with them. And they do this every year. And then all of a sudden you get this influx of chickens. It's a sad thing because they can't always go to homes. And so Kippy was probably raised by humans because she was really a people's chicken, as it was described to me. And she probably wouldn't be able to go just on a farm because she would have trouble acclimating. And they asked me if I wanted to foster her. But I had just finished up writing my last book, Sugar Detox Me. And I was on a I was on a book tour and I was like, hey, I'm on a book tour for another two weeks. I can't, I can't take a chicken. That's crazy. They said, yeah, but after your book tour. <laughs> and for two weeks I started thinking about her and thinking about her. And then I went back and I was like, got it into my head. Yeah, of course it's gonna be a great idea to foster a chicken in my Brooklyn apartment. <laughs> It's brought me and woven me into the community a lot deeper because, as I had mentioned, I volunteer at the Senior Citizen Service Center. They had a chicken coop. It was a deplorable chicken coop. They had four chickens, and I did not want to put my chicken in that chicken coop. So we ended up raising funds for them, building a new chicken coop. We got other foster chickens. And so Kippy is a part-time hen out in the uh, chicken coop. So I let her out there during the day so she could run around with the other chickens And I come pick her up at night and she spends time with me in the morning and on rainy days because she doesn't like to go outside and on snowy days because she doesn't like to go outside. But the funny thing is, is that she's got such a dominant personality that even though she's a part time chicken in the coop, she is the main chicken, which anybody who raises chickens, they have a hierarchy and a pecking order, which is very important to their social dynamics. And so I find it fascinating that Kippy has established herself as the main hen, especially as like the former main hen has gotten older and has like stepped down as a lower hen to a certain degree. But like some of the other hens like still revere her. It's a strange thing. I'm I'm, I'm fascinated by chicken dynamics. <laughs> what a great story. What is it like having a chicken in your home? Is it toilet trained? Uh, no, the chicken is not completely toilet trained. And what I how I want to describe that is I will roll up carpets But not all of them, because there's some that she just likes to walk on. But if anything's comfortable in the house, namely beds, couches, she will not defecate there because that is a potential nest place. And chickens are smart like that. So she will poop and I will have to clean it up on the floor. And chickens, I will have to tell you, they poop about 30 times a day. And I know my chicken's bowel movements pretty well. And if I'm looking at her, I could usually tell when she's about to poop. (laughs) And so it's not something that I would recommend to people. But there was also that after a while, I feel like I had no other choice but to take her. And I felt like that was my responsibility now. So I want to encourage people that chickens, even though I believe that they are such a great pet, and if they were potty trainable, which I've heard some people are able to potty train their chickens when they're raised closely with a dog or cat and they see where the dog or cat goes. However, it's not always a guarantee. But I do believe that if they were more potty trainable, that they would totally be up there with dogs and cats because they are intelligent creatures. And in fact, actually, a peer-reviewed science journal just came out and looking at how you know chickens are on par with social behavior, emotions, with some of the higher mammals and birds out there. I believe that. I mean, I feel like I'm a little bit biased, and but I grew up with chickens as a kid, but I never really understood them as well as I feel like I do now, having lived with one for two and a half years. <laughs> so cool. And how does she interact with your plants? 
You know, now that I give her some time outside, she's very good with them. When I didn't have a coop to put her in, she was reckless and she would just ravage some of my plants. So I had to kind of move them up. There are still certain plants that she will just eat, mow over if I just leave them on the ground, like my maiden hair ferns, like she will just mow over those. But she generally is really good. By the time she gets back from the coop, I mean, most of the time she's pretty sleepy. She wants to chill out. She'll eat her own food. She'll sleep on my feet. And then she'll want to go and and roost. Is it true she's traveled with you on the subway? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How did that go? There's only two options with Kippy. I could either take her with me or I could leave her in the coop. But she can't be by herself. She has like severe social anxiety if I kind of left her. So, yes. So and if I have to go and travel and she's not in the coop, I have to take her with me. Yeah. So she likes to travel on the subway. She'll travel in Uber. (laughs) She's very good. I have her in a this little bubble that I actually picked her up in because it was like the little finch carrier that I brought the oven bird in from Wild Bird Fun. So she really recognizes her little bubble and she's just a little bit too big for it, but she still kind of like sits in it comfortably because she's a smaller hen and she's she's a Rhode Island red, but she's like a tiny compared to some hen breeds. And she just loves sitting in the bubble. And as she could be crying and crying and crying. And as soon as I put her in the bubble and like literally rock her, she'll go right to bed. I mean, she's just kind of like a little baby. So funny. So Summer, I want to get into your diet. Can you walk us through what you gravitate towards eating? Someone who's so into growing. A question also is, do you grow some of your own food? But yeah, what does your current diet look like? Yeah, during the summertime, I will actually grow a little bit of food, but it's mainly like herbs. And actually this year in my community garden plot, I wasn't growing as much food as I typically am because I knew I was going to be traveling for the summer months due to book tour. So I actually planted more perennials this year that could pretty much take care of themselves. I gravitate mainly to vegetables and whole foods. And admittedly, As I was writing my book and doing editing, because I edit all my YouTube videos and it takes about 80% of my time right now, sometimes I just don't have the energy to cook all the time. So I'd been eating out a little bit more than I would have liked, which is fine, because I think that once you have a foundation of healthy eating, you could always fall back onto the foundation. And actually, that's one of the things that I had really recommended with people with the last book that I wrote, which is removing sugar from your diet, which is something that I like to subscribe by is like reducing the amount of sugar in one's diet. And that has always been one of my kind of growing up as a kid. That was one of the things that had really, I just recognized that that was like the one thing that I kind of, I don't want to say struggled with, but it's just like, I felt like I never went a day without sugar in some way, shape or form. And so I kind of wanted to navigate around that. And that got me into focusing on whole foods. Like literally, I just made uh, stewed wheat berries with shoju and also with butternut squash, just potatoes and carrots and with a little bit of turmeric lemongrass paste. And that was like just really delicious. And of course, it's something that I could also feed Kippy because she likes wheat berries. And that lasted me for two days. So I still have a little bit of leftover that I made from from yesterday. So I think like those things is what I'm focused on. And now that I'm finished writing the book and I'm towards the tail end of my book tour, yesterday was actually really the first day that I got to cook for myself again. And that was refreshing. (laughs) As somebody who grew up spending so much time outside, are you into foraging at all? I know you're in New York City. I don't know how many opportunities there are in the city, but is that something you're into? I think the last time that I actually went foraging was quite a number of years ago when I was in Great Bear National Rain Forest and also towards Sacred Headwaters. And I found this patch on the top of the mountain of morel mushrooms. And morel mushrooms are, they're just like an incredible delicacy. They're so amazing to see. They look like little brains, tall, like conehead brains. And they're delicious. And there must have been, oftentimes they kind of come up during a recent burn or fire and it was on the top of the mountain. So maybe there was like a little lightning strike or whatever. But I ended up just getting a bunch of morel mushrooms. I'm not saying that like mushrooms are the only thing to forage, but it just it's what came to mind because that was probably the last time that I went foraging. However, 
I just got a bunch of those morel mushrooms, but I haven't tried them in the community garden. But I did inoculate the soil in the community garden in the back and the wood chips with King Stropharia mushrooms. And I think it's called Stropharia rugulosum. And I had a major flush of King Stropharia mushrooms this spring. It was insane. I mean, I had to get like 20 pounds a day. So I don't know if this is technically considered foraging, but like I was foraging those wood chips back there and the people thought I was crazy. Uh, And I also recently had gotten the soil tested beforehand. So I knew that I could actually throw the spawn out there and actually get a flush of mushrooms and feel comfortable actually eating them. But I think some of the other people within the community garden thought I was like literally like I lost my gourd. But I see that like as no different. But no, you wouldn't want to forage like on the roadsides or anything around here in New York City. And unfortunately, we don't have the type of city where it's looked upon greatly to be able to like pick fruit off a tree. But I've been to other cities. I I was just in London recently, for instance, and there was like a pear tree in this guy's courtyard area. I did try eating it and it was like terrible. It was absolutely inedible. It made my mouth like really dry. And it felt like I got Novocaine in my teeth. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, God, this is awful. But I don't mind actually doing those things and and trying them out. But being in the environment that I am in, you can't do it as easily. So if I move to the country again, you better believe that I'll be looking for like chanterelles and other things in the forest. Well, that's where I want to wrap up this conversation. You've built this plant oasis in the city. Do you see yourself ever going back to the country? And if so... Have you ever considered what that would take to move all your plants? Oh, yeah. I mean, I definitely think that I would get a second place, perhaps, or, you know, eventually move to the country, take my work with me. But I think it's like the transition. Definitely want to practice more permacultural principles and things along those lines. I'm trying to do that very loosely now in the community garden for as much as they can let me do. Yeah, I want to go back to my roots and be able to do those things. And I think that, you know, a lot of folks are like, oh, country life, city life. But I'm actually chatting with a few of my kind of creative counterparts, really good friends here in the city because I've made some really good friends. And we're thinking about going in on a plot of land a little bit away from the city. And we don't know what that will look like. And we haven't found like the perfect piece of land yet. But It is one of those things that I'm thinking of and I don't worry about like, what am I going to do to like move all these plants or whatever? I mean, I just feel like I'll cross that bridge when I come to it, but there's no point in actually worrying about it now. So Summer, we've talked about so much stuff and I think our listeners have gained so much new knowledge. I know Jesse and I have. We're so excited, as he said, (laughs) to up our plant game at home and to really get inspired to get in touch with, with our growing practices. So before we wrap up, one last question. What does ultimate health mean to you? I think ultimate health actually just means being your fullest self and and feeding yourself, you know, with the right people, with the right creative energy, with the right community around you every day. It's about a mindset and also so it's not just for me like the the physical aspect of it or even what you put in your stomach, but it's also how you feed yourself with the world around you. I love that. And other than listeners getting a copy of your new book, How to Make a Plant Love You, how can they connect with you after the show? They could connect with me on my YouTube channel. It's my name, Summer Rain Oaks. The channel is called Plant One On Me and on Instagram at Homestead Brooklyn. All right. Thank you, Summer. We're going to link everything up over at ultimahealthpodcast.com. And I really enjoyed this conversation. Great to connect with you. And wishing you all the best. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Pleasure speaking with you. You as well. Take care. Bye. Take care. We hope you're as inspired as we are to fill your home with plants. Summer is definitely a great resource, and you can't not want to at least get one new plant after listening to today's show. And we'd love to hear some of the takeaways that you learned from today. Let us know over on Instagram. Be sure to tag Ultimate Health Podcast and tag Homestead Brooklyn. You're going to want to follow her account anyways just to get inspired. So go ahead and do that. And while you're at it, also share this episode and other episodes that you love of ours to your friends, family, colleagues, whoever is in your life that you know wants to be inspired and live the way of ultimate health. So thanks for sharing our episodes. It means the world to us. It's the best way to grow our show and get our message out to the world. Thank you for helping us spread the good word. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash 326. We have links there to everything we discussed in a show summary, so be sure and check that out. 
And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jace Anderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, we really appreciate all you do. Thank you so much. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that he bought some more power tools for do-it-yourself projects around the house. It's interesting. I actually got a bunch of new power tools handed down to me. My parents, they moved from a house and downsized into a condo. And I got a bunch of new power tools that I'm excited to put to good use as well. Have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.